Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last panel of this conference, today's conference. Our task, our theme is the economic potential of data, open data, that is. Uh, listening to all the stuff that has been said not only today, one might be tempted to say or to sum it up into one word, and that is huge. Uh, there are many, many sources and resources that claim pretty much the same. We have the World Economic Forum saying that open data are the next big oil or are the oil of the 21st century, to be precise. We have uh, the respected, well-respected consultancy, McKinsey, putting a price tag on it. Last year they claimed that there's uh, approximately $7 trillion to be made every year if we actually use the open data big data, open data. Uh, I know that it's not a synonymous, but sometimes at least some people say it should be uh, properly. So the question is, first of all, which data should we use, which data should be open, how to open them, and obviously which data should be uh, stay closed or remain closed and secretive, if you will. And last but not least, how to tap those uh, that have and economic potential. These are just few questions we shall tackle today. We have six distinguished panelists, which is quite a lot. We have approximately 50 minutes, which is not enough, definitely. And we have uh, a rather uncharted territory in front of us. So without further ado, let me proceed with a short introduction of our panelists, and then we shall start. Uh, let me welcome Richard Sterling, International Director of Open Data Institute, a UK nonprofit, and let me quote, that is catalyzing the evolution of open data culture to create value, value as well as, uh, or among other things, economic value. Chris Taggart, CEO of Open Corporates, a website which shares data on corporate entities. Uh, Chris also came to us from the United Kingdom. We have Richard Swedenham, advisor for open data to the European Commission. And then in a Czech national jersey, three gentlemen. Vladislav Čapek, CEO of Geosense, a small Czech company, startup, that is uh, active and very successful, one might say, in the field of geographic information systems. We have Michal Feix, CEO of Seznam CZ. I think that nobody needs to hear an elaborate description of that particular company, but just to be fair, web portal, search engine, the big one in the Czech Republic. And last but not least, Martin Burda, uh, founder and director of investment consultancy, Capital Linked. Okay, gentlemen, first, a warm-up round, one might say it. I'll ask each of you one question. I'll ask you to answer, if possible, in two, maximum three minutes, so we can actually discuss which is, I'm pretty sure everybody is here for, or something everybody is here for. First question to you, Richard, and since we have two Richards on our panel, I'll use uh, your last name, Richard Swedenham. The European economic growth remains sluggish uh, and the prospect is not very good. So every economic potential, every new engine, or if not the whole engine, then a valve, one might say it is rather welcome at the moment. When we look at the data, do we know how much it can actually, or the European economy can benefit out of the data, the proper use of data? Uh, well, uh, you can uh, find quite a lot of figures about this. Uh, we uh, had one uh, study done which came up with a figure of uh, 40 billion euros. Uh, in any case, the, the, by definition, we're talking about data which is already there, whether it's in the private sector or what I uh, am particularly dealing with, which is the data collected by the public sector. Uh, any way that uh, this can be uh, used uh, more widely and get uh, an economic return uh, is... Uh, a chance that we uh, uh, have to grasp with both hands. Thank you. Just to be precise, that is 40 billion 
per year or 40 per billion year. total? Per okay, year. excellent, thank you. Richard Sterling, uh, a question to you. Big data are sometimes being compared to transformative technologies such as the steam engine or steam locomotive to be precise, or the radio. Uh, however, some experts say it is a new thing and quite significant, but it's not transformative or revolutionary. Uh, your take and uh, reasoning behind. Thank you. Um, so I would say that uh, it is a, a great new technology. Um, all of the examples of technology that you gave me just then uh, were at the time looked at as niche industry. Uh, it took 20 or 30 years for the impact to be felt. Um, it feels like we're at the same type of uh, tipping point now with uh, open data and big data um, approaches in that everybody is looking at them, trying to work out what the, the size of the impact is. Every time a new consultancy comes out with a, a report, then the number gets bigger. Uh, so you can almost tell when the report was written as to how many zeros come on the end. Um, and to me, that's a sign that uh, the technology is uh, being felt in ever wider bits of the economy. You know, it's, it's spreading out, it's an enabler. It's not an end in and of itself unless you're a particular technology company selling uh, big data or open data technologies. Um, but it is an enabler for uh, new types of products, uh, greater personalization, uh, greater tailoring, and uh, better efficiency. Um, and with open data, you see that in some of the, the, the examples that people have shown already today, uh, but you see that elsewhere in the economy. So it is a game changer, in other words? Well, I, I think so. But yeah, I would say that, I'm certain, from right. the Open Data Institute. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get there, okay. Uh, Ladislav Chapek, uh, your company might be considered a good example of how one might create nothing out of, or excuse me, something <laughs> out you. of nothing. A very Freudian slip. Can you erase that for there, please? <laughs> no, those, uh, thank you. Well, we start. Okay. We started Jolson something Sin out of <laughs> <laughs> something out of nothing. In other words, create a value, economic value, value yeah, uh, out of I would say, idle I would say data. Definitely, we started uh, our business in 2010, and everybody said uh, it's a closed business. Market is saturated. Uh, we do information system powered by maps. You saw a lot of uh, cataster data from Mr. Polacek. And uh, we, do, we started to do portals for uh, small villages, cities in the Czech Republic. And in 2010, we got like a two, two customers. And after two years, we were about 1,200 12, of customers in the a, in a Czech Republic. What was the biggest obstacle? What was the biggest hurdle or to highest get, hurdle, if you To will. get uh, free data, open data from cadastre office, which are free for municipalities. And uh, later on, we got you know planning, zoning, utilities. We hire more people. We are about today like 30 people company. We set up office in Slovakia because if it's working in you know, Czech, let's move somewhere else. Let's copy the model. And on the top of all those data, we create our applications. And uh, last year, we went to Silicon Valley. We set up company over there, and. Of course, we hire, you know, uh, quite expensive uh, developers. We create uh, new jobs for the economy. So I don't think so, like, Cataster Office is, you know, crying because we don't pay for data. But, you know, the <laughs> unemployment office is very happy because, you know, we are giving more and more work to people in the in Czech Republic. If I'm not mistaken, oh, yeah, Mr. Polacek <laughs> is still here, so you can... <laughs> You, you, you can pick it up uh, in the discussion part of, uh, of uh, our panel, the, the, the sort of a proverbial glove that has been thrown into the ring. Uh, Michal Fikes says, Nam says that, uh, from your perspective, big company, we've heard from the startup, small company, uh, from your perspective, where is the potential? Where would you say is the biggest potential at the moment in the Czech Republic in particular? Um. First of all, good afternoon. Um, it's, it's quite a hard question for the beginning, but definitely the correct answer is that there is a great potential for the Czech Republic right now, because usually 
it, it's quite funny. You, you usually need more people to get the data from the public sector than the people uh, to actually process them. That's that's the current current status in the Czech Republic. So, unfortunately. There is not much data at the moment that you could use for, for any business potential that you might actually have. Um, we are trying to get the public transport data at the moment, which is, which is a quite famous story for two years already. Um, I believe after two years we are almost at the, at the, at the end uh, and successful end, uh, fortunately. But uh, I can't imagine that uh, you would have to spend two or three years for every kind of public data that you would eventually uh, like to use for, for business or for some business purposes. So I I'm quite convinced that the potential is, is, is tremendous. But... Uh, we have not crossed the very basic point at the moment. The public sector as a whole is, is unfortunately convinced that when you ask them for, for some data for, for your per business purposes, um, they, they have a strong feeling like you are trying to steal the data from them. They, they usually don't understand that they are actually working with the data that you pay from your taxes. It doesn't matter if you're a citizen or if, you, if you're a business, um, it, it's your data actually, it's our data as a Czech business, or as a Czech people. And this is, this is the breaking point. I, I believe we have to break this point before we can describe the amount of the potential that, that's actually there. Okay, so the, the transportation, transportation data you mentioned, uh, that battle is almost over. Uh, what's the next one for you? What are we going to read about uh, tomorrow or, you know, next week? Well, I'm, I'm not going to describe the whole company strategy for the next 15 years right at the, at the table, but, but yes, there are definitely some, some, some other topics like, like um, no, no, I'm not going into that. <laughs> it, it would be rather rewarding for, the, for our audience, you know. Anyway, uh, Martin Burda, where, where do... Martin, over there, okay. Uh, from your perspective, meaning you're meeting a lot of investors, people who are looking for opportunities and are not really fixed on data per se, they just want decent return potential. Uh, are investors in the Czech Republic already interested? Do they see the potential in this kind of business or sector? Well, obviously among investors, uh, uh, data analytic companies uh, are drawing huge interest. Uh, it's usually in angel investment or private investment area because there are not many publicly traded companies. It's, it's, it's a young industry, a uh, lot of very successful startups. In the Czech Republic, we have some very successful companies. I could name Futurelytics, Brand Embassy, and uh, the most successful, obviously, uh, is Social Bakers, which was founded by, uh, I think, 27-year-old entrepreneur, Jan Řeža. You should remember that name. I mean, when I was 27, I was still at school. And he built a company that re quite recently got $26 million in secondary financing from a private equity fund, uh, you know, with offices ranging from San Francisco to Hong Kong. So there are some very successful companies, even in the local market. Uh, if you want to invest uh, in them, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, maybe it's potentially very attractive investment, but it's usually a private equity fund arena at this point. Are you personally investing into this kind of business or one of these types of businesses? I don't like cult stocks, so I'm not in Facebook. But <laughs> No, no, I, uh, I'm, I'm closer to the Buffett-like way of investing. I want to see uh, some foreseeable profits. I mean, these companies often burn money. Uh, no, no, but the, the, this is a very promising uh, area, but not many publicly traded, sto traded stocks, and I'm not involved in private equity funds, so, so uh, not yet. But I follow, follow the, uh, the industry very closely. It will be, there will be some very interesting stories, and I, I believe that companies like Cessnam uh, will, uh, in the future, will be looking for successful, successful startups in this area. Last but not least, Chris Tagger. Uh, Chris, so far, a lot of optimism. Let's uh, try to tone it down a notch, or maybe two. What are the cons, or maybe not cons, but uh, potential problems, things for, to, to look for, or to be aware of, if you will, when it comes to data, economic potential, or more generally potential, and the near future? Um. 
My background's in the private sector. I used to be a journalist. I run magazine companies. Um, I've only been dealing with governments for four years. Um, and uh, it's been an interesting experience, <laughs> frustrating one as well. Um, I've been impressed by some enormously good people uh, we've, that have really done a lot. But I think that the, the, one of the difficulties is that the, we're talking different languages. One of the reasons why big, big giant companies get giant government contracts is because they talk the same language. And, you know, the, 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 one of the things is, is that, you know, governments often talk about SMEs and encouraging them, but they don't understand the opportunity cost. With small companies, it's all about opportunity cost. You know, you don't have, you know, uh, six months to be, you know, to, to be trying to, or, two, or three years to be trying to get the transport data. You know, you don't have, you know, the question is, is what can you do today? What can you do this month? What can you do really quickly in order to, to, to make this happen? Uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, companies are, are, are great about uh, innovating and, and, and getting on with things. It's only when you get to those big ones that have got big lobbying organizations, that have got big infrastructures, that actually understand how governments do business, that actually that it works on that. that those timescales actually are great if you want to kill innovation. That's why I would, you know, I, I would argue that the critical things about open data is getting on with it. Um, and, and, and without thinking, you know, without trying to predict what is going to be done with it. I, I strongly disagree with some of the comments on the last panel. The thing is, is that governments are really the last people that should be predicting what should be going on, you know, what should be getting done with the data. Because the point about innovation is it's not been done before. That's what makes it innovation. You don't know what's going to, what, you know, if you, if you knew what was going to happen, it wouldn't be innovation. Um, if, you could under, if you knew it was going to be certain success, then lot, you know, everybody would be doing it. There has to be the ability for things to start, to fail, to get on with things. And the more that you make, the, the, the fewer barriers that there are, the more innovation you enable. To me, the critical thing about, it's not about open data, it's about the critical thing about closed data <laughs> is, 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 and particularly data, the, 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 this data that is sold by governments. Well, you wouldn't buy something if you could, you wouldn't buy something if you could get it for free. So along with selling it, you are saying, right, we're going to restrict access to all these people. You're going to restrict access to these, without the, to, to, to these people, um, you know, let's say, without lots of money. Or you're going to restrict access to these people without an existing large customer base and an existing business model that works. Well, that's almost like the definition of killing innovation. So I would, uh, you know, I, I, I really want to strongly say that I think that this is, from a, from a purely private sector point of view, from an innovator's point of view, this, these are some of the barriers that we face. We don't have time to be spending six months, 12 months, three years to be, to be engaging with government and going along to all these sorts of things and, and, uh, and doing it because we've got bills to pay. Long story short, uh, do I get it correctly? You're saying put all the data out there and let people, firms, work. Is that right? I think, you know, the, the cost of getting out there is, in most cases, most of the data is, uh, is trivial. It's not that there are no costs. There are costs. There are people that have to be hired in order to just do some of these trivial jobs. They still have to be hired. Now, obviously, there are a certain amount of, private, uh, of prioritization that needs to be done, and that can be done by demand, what, what people are asking for. That doesn't mean that you, 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 know, um, you have to go with these incredibly high, uh, high, high hurdles, but, but you know, there's a, a question of demand. Personally, I would start with those, those uh, data sets for which the government charges money. You know there's a demand for that. You know that there's a restricted audience for that. That seems like a pretty good, you know, the, the, and those restricted audiences actually paying for, for exclusivity, in a sense. You know, so whether it's cadastral data, whether it's uh, uh, company data, um, you know, all those sorts of ones, those, that's where I'd start. Very interesting idea. Anybody? Unfortunately, we don't have anybody on this panel, I'm afraid, who would oppose this kind of idea, or do we? Martin, you? No, well, I would not oppose it, uh, uh, frankly. Then let's... Yes, oh, thank you. Thank you. Are we all off but me? Thank you. Is there somebody in the audience who would actually oppose that? 
just for the sake of uh, the devil's advocate being present. No? Not? Okay. All right. So I'll just finish uh, it by May. Time to react. Yeah. Okay, Martin, you're clearly, uh, no. you have something uh, you need to say. So yeah, go. yeah, I just wanted to uh, applaud Chris on, on, on his latest contribution because this is exactly what we should take away from this meeting. If there are any politicians here, you know, the only message they should take away, please open the data sources. There's a lot of value in it, obviously, but it's up to the private sector to discover where, where the value is. There will be a lot of trials and errors, but please don't try to show us the way. You know, I was reading a lot of, um, all three big documents, the US Big Data Initiative, uh, EU Initiative, Australian Initiative. Uh, if, you, if you look at the speech of uh, Neely Kroes, is, she's the commissioner uh, for digital agenda for the EU, in Vilnius, I think last month, it's so general. I mean, politicians don't have a better clue than myself, you know, what to do with the big data. I don't, just don't understand. Leave it up to the private sector, you know. They will discover the value. Open the data and don't mix up with it. Richard, uh, and by Richard, I mean Richard Swedenheim. Uh, what in particular, let's be concrete, what in particular would you say the European Union Commission, the institutions per se, are going to do or should do so the economy can profit out of the economic potential of data soon? Well, we're certainly not doing what the private sector is telling us not to do, which is to tell them what they uh, need. Uh, what we are doing is to put in place the um, uh, both the, the legal and the uh, practical uh, possibility uh, for the uh, producers of the data in the public sector to uh, make this accessible and, and open. Uh, we've done this through a directive. Uh, we are providing a, a portal for uh, uh, making it easier to find uh, data. Uh, we are um, uh, providing uh, a certain amount of funding for training. We are uh, bringing people uh, together from the public sector to discuss uh, the practical issues and uh, uh, share experience. And uh, the, the fact that I'm here today is just uh, one example, I mean, this is a, an, an excellent initiative uh, by the uh, conference organizers. And uh, what we need is to get uh, both the uh, potential users of this data, the reusers, uh, uh, to um, uh, it's not just to uh, work on the um, uh, on the applications, but uh, unfortunately, some of that time that they don't really have, uh, I think uh, we have to find a way of uh, sending uh, uh, messages uh, from uh, people, I mean, if we're talking about Czech data, people in the Czech Republic, uh, so that the politicians understand that this really is Im important. Uh, and it's something they can do something about, they say they've already got the data. Uh, in fact, all they have to do is to stop doing something, which is to stop stopping people reusing it. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the only way that this, um, this potential is going to be fully realized is by uh, everybody uh, doing what they can. The, the public bodies, they're already collecting the data, the politicians have to tell them to open it up. Uh, uh, opening it up, uh, as Chris said, costs a little bit of money, but uh, not very much compared to the uh, uh, economic benefits uh, to the uh, society as a whole. And um, uh, this uh, must be recognized as, as, as a priority uh, for action uh, by the public sector. Very quick, very quick follow-up or short follow-up. Uh, first of all, where do you see the biggest uh, economic value or potential at the moment? Which data set 
do you like the most from this perspective and how likely it is that we're going to see it being open soon? Well, obviously, uh, Chris has, has already mentioned the, the data sets which are currently uh, often uh, charged for. That's uh, things like uh, the mapping data, the, uh, the company information, the um, uh, weather data, and uh, that uh, char char dropping charges for that. Uh, the studies we've done have shown actually can generate um, uh, more money looked at in the bigger picture than is currently being uh, raised. Uh, another area which is obviously of interest to everybody uh, is uh, transport data, whether it be the uh, public sector or the private sector, and, and my colleagues uh, in Brussels uh, work in the transport sector are, are, are looking at uh, what we can do uh, to um, uh, open this up from a, a legal point of view. But the, uh, there again, if uh, to the extent that these are, are publicly owned um, organizations, uh, they really ought to be re releasing this uh, uh, data uh, um, without anybody having to uh, force them to do it. Thank you. Gentlemen on the panel, any other thoughts? Uh, do you feel like reacting to anything that has been said? And at the same time, ask, I'm asking you, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, it is going to be your turn, opportunity, chance, however you want to phrase it, to ask our distinguished panelists. But first, gentlemen, anything to add to what has been said? Michal, um, thank you. Um, there was a question, what topics are important for a company like Seznam? So uh, let me stress one important point out. Um, it's completely irrelevant which topics are important for a company like Seznam, because Seznam is not the only company in the Czech Republic, and we have not eaten all the ideas in the world, so uh, there are tons of other companies and individuals which have an idea what to potentially do with the data when they became available. So, um, completely agree with what have been already said here. Um, it's not a question for the government which data should be published all the data should be actually published. And then there are citizens and the businesses in the Czech Republic which will decide what is potentially relevant. Um, we are fighting with the recession, we are fighting with unemployment, um, we are trying to find new ways how to help businesses and how to lower the unemployment in Czech Republic or, or whole EU. And we already have the, the cure on the table. It, it's the data that we already have, there is no much more work to, to grab some other, other sources of information. We already have all the data available. We just have to make them publicly available for the businesses so they can find new ways how to create new, new services, new products, which will employ more and more people, which will help the economy and which will lower the unemployment. So I think it's quite obvious that it's, it's not that simple that I've just described. Of course, there, are, there is some work which will cost money as well to, to make the data freely available, to solve the licenses issues, to, uh, to change certain, certain laws which, which apply to the current status quo. But this, this is quite a minimal amount of work when you compare to the amount of, of income which we as a Czech Republic could have or the whole European Union can have. So I don't think there is anything to discuss. I think it's just time to start doing it and doing it well. And if you, if you forget everything what I've just said, um, which, is, which is quite possible, then you can, you can have a look at the PSI directive, which has been, which has been acknowledged, oh, I'm not quite sure, one, one year ago, or maybe, maybe two years ago, which, which actually says, from, from the point of European Commission, that every member state of the EU has to, uh, I think the term is half of 2015, July 2015, every, every member state have to implement this directive, which actually says, you have to give the public data and you have to make them usable by in a, in a machine usable form to the businesses and to the public. And if you don't care about the, the income for, for the Czech businesses, for the Czech Republic, for the Czech economy, it's already on the table by the European Commission. And the term is July 2015. So no, no matter actually what we 
think about the open data from the business perspective, it, it, it's actually not just the one issue that we should have a look at. There is another issue which is called a directive from the European Commission which just has to be implemented till July 2015. So there are at least two good reasons why we should make the data public as soon as possible. Thank you, just two technical, rather technical points. First of all, I would say that uh, profits for Czech businesses and unemployment um, are somehow more sexy than European directive, no, no offense, Richard. And second, obviously, uh, the question that aimed at what Seznam considers interesting was, uh, let's say, powered or was inspired by the very fact that I expect Seznam to know where the potential really is. Uh, Ladislav, you wanted to add something uh, into a discussion, so it's your turn. Yeah, I just wanted to say we are talking about uh, data quality, about formats, how to exchange data, but the biggest issue, there are no data. So uh, I'm saying to, you know, to government, give me the data. I don't care about, you know, uh, if it's wrong or, uh, you know, about accuracy, precision. I will give you some feedback, but the first, I need to see those data. So, uh, and it's generally a big difference between, I would say, Europe and United States when we work over there. You go on a main street in uh, San Francisco with your smartphone, you just click on a, on a lot, on a parcel, and you got 550 layers for free. Do whatever you like. So we can build you know, some zoning analyzer from the Czech Republic, our developers, and uh, we can help you know, American economy. So if we can get all those data, like in Europe checked, so it will be great and it will help everybody. Out of a curiosity, where are we at the moment? How uh, many in layers? In layers? Yeah. Actually, you can ask Eliška from the city of Prague <laughs> if there are any free layers. I mean, it's, it's getting better. I'm very optimistic. And uh, you can get some free services, but still not uh, free data. So you have to pay for it. Sometimes it's just, you know, some funny, funny fee which is few crowns, so it's more administration, but uh, yeah, we are moving, moving forward, but it's still a lot of hard, hard work. So I believe there are some politicians still around, so give us free data and we will give you high employment. <laughs> Michal, you wanted to add something. Um, I have to say I usually agree with Ladislav, but with all due respect, um, I, don't, I can't agree with, with the thesis that um, hello government, just give us any data, we don't care if they are correct or not, um, just let's, let's make that uh, checkpoint that we, we have given some data and it's done already. No, no please don't. Um, there is already many bad examples with, with, uh, with uh, such an attitude. Um, uh, I have a one very, very late one uh, from yesterday um, when the European Parliament's been discussing the data protection regulation um, and um, I was sitting in Prague, I was trying to, to find some information, how, how's, the, how, how's the real thing going on. Um, and uh, on Wednesday I was trying to access the EU website to find some information regarding the, the, the votes on, on the topic of data regulation and there are all the paraxes on the EU websites that say we are transparent, we are giving all the data that you can have and uh, here is a search form, you can just enter what you like and we will give you the document. So I was trying to find all the documents from, from the last few days regarding the data protection and uh, all the results, all the links were actually going to, to file not found uh, error pages which are completely useless to you. So um, maybe it was just a temporary problem. Unfortunately, two hours ago I was trying it again and it still made the same error. So, so I don't know how, how long it will take the, the guys which are responsible for the EU website to fix this. But this is, this is the other point. When, when you give some data and you don't make a relevant attempt to make them correct and to make them accessible, to anyone who is trying to use the data, then you will actually make the thing worse because this is exactly the attitude that you don't want to have regarding the open data. You don't want people to have the feeling like, 
okay, so what's the open data for? If I try to use them, I, I can't find the information that I'm looking for. So, so the final attitude which is inside you after such, such, uh, such an attempt is, okay, it's, it, it's nothing usable. It, it's actually not working. And this is, this is the strong point. I believe that when we are trying to give the data public, we should stress that the data that we are giving has to be valid and they have to be accessible. And if that means that we will have to make smaller steps at the beginning, just to, not, just to have as, as, as less errors as possible, then I believe this is the correct way. I, I think it's a wrong, it's a wrong way to, to make, make errors by the way and to make many of them and trying to say, okay, we are just, we are just public, so, so please excuse. Thank you. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? One question over there. Hello, hello. Do, is Just it? speak up. Okay. Uh, I'm Peter Kuchera, Charles University Faculty of Science. I want to ask about attitude of companies uh, to open data when they work with it, if they uh, are if they are wanting to pass it on in form of open data again. Uh, I mean, in a, as an example, can be uh, data on usage of search engines or data on usage of uh, people searching transportation data. I think from my scientific point of view that such an insight on how people use services built on open data itself has a value as an open data. So how are companies wanting to share this? Thank you. Very good question. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, gentl gentlemen from the UK, first I would like to ask for your perspective or your take on this particular issue. Meaning it's nice uh, to fight for an open data if you're a company you're going to make a lot of money out of it. But uh, shouldn't you give something in return? Who's going to take it first? Okay, Chris. Well, what, what, what makes open corporates unique um, is that we not only pull data from company registers around the world, but also from others, you know, and, and many other sources now. Hundreds, thousands, you know, soon to be thousands of different sources. Um, but we also make that data available to, to other people. It's there, on, not just there on the website freely. Uh, we, we, uh, we make, uh, to the extent that we have rights from cleaning it up and, and doing things with it, we make those rights available under a share-alike attribution license. We have an API. If you're going to be publishing more data, if you're going to incorporate this into an open data data set, then you can just get an API key and do that. And, uh, uh, and we, our business model is that that people who want to keep this private and put, or mix it into proprietary data sets, um, that, they, that they have to uh, pay for the privilege of doing that so that they, they contribute back to the open data community. Now, that gives two, two advantages. One is that this creates a, a commons of, of, of company data and, uh, and, and as companies will start to add information about themselves, that's going to be really important that that is a commons. But the other thing is, is that we can do something, and it was mentioned, I think, by um, uh, 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 this, uh, this afternoon about the, the issue of, uh, of provenance. What we can do is we can say, we got this information from this place on this date, from this company register, and so on. We can, you know, now, now that provenance, not just where we got it from, but when we got it from, and increasingly, as we are doing things like network data, which I'll mention in, in the presentation, how we, how we, how we, wh why we believe that, how we computed that, that's critical. It's critical because it's, it's the right thing to do. It's critical because I think provenance is something that is important that everyone should have. It gives them confidence. Uh, it also means, and this is why proprietary providers don't do this, because they don't want you to know where they got the data from, either because you might go get it yourself and cut them out of the equation because they're not really adding value. They're just you know, uh, uh, rent-seeking. Uh, and the second reason is, is sometimes they get it from extremely dubious sources and you wouldn't have confidence in it. 
But we think that's really important, not just because it gives you confidence in it and allows you to go and do the same thing that we've done. So we're not, it's not about, a, 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 it's about genuine adding value. But the second thing is, is that this is context. This, this provenance is the context. If we're saying something and it was a, and it was a, a day ago, or we're something and it was three and it was achieved three years ago, then that's that's actually really quite different types of data. If it comes from this government data source or that government data source, different types of data. That provenance turns out to actually be really important when you're doing modelling, when you're doing all sorts of stuff. I hope that there will be many more companies like us that will be saying what we're going to be doing is we're going to be you know it, it, we're going to be not just we're going to be opening up our you know opening up the data and allow other other people to do it. Uh, maybe the, we're, we're, maybe we are fairly unique. I hope not, but I think it's I, I think we have a responsibility, and actually I think it's good business as well because um, uh, th then people will be more confident knowing that we're both in terms of we're adding value and, and when they are contributing through crowdsourcing or other things, they'll be confident knowing that they're, they're contributing to an open uh, data source. Thank you, Chris. Richard. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think that Chris has just given you a really good explanation of why a business might want to uh, open up some of the data either because it's consuming open data and it wants to show the provenance, oh, sorry, uh, or, um, you know, other reasons. And I think the answer will vary from company to company as to whether uh, they will want to open up the data, uh, the data on the other side. So some companies will want to uh, use the open data to generate insights to uh, sell that insight and may not open up their data. Other companies will have, like Chris has, a business where the, the data integrity is really important and they'll, uh, as a result, they'll open up all the way through the chain. Other companies uh, may not be consuming open data but might open up some of their data anyway. Um, you know, we're, we're working with some of the, the companies in our, our membership around uh, th or sort of through that challenge and uh, in areas where they might want to open up. Um, but there's also uh, companies like uh, Tesco is one of our major um, retailers. They're looking at opening up the data about their supply chain so that they can show to their customers the provenance of what they're eating. Um, now, that was a response to a particular scandal they had in the UK. Um, but it's a, uh, just an indication of how some of the, the concepts that you've heard through the day uh, applying to the public sector also apply to private sector businesses. And there are sort of four or five main drivers as to why businesses may want to open up data. Some of them because they're consuming open data, some of them just because it reinforces their existing business model. Thank you very much. Now, Michal. Um, I'm really interested in your answer to this particular question. Oh, I'm quite afraid. Um, I think it's it's a it, it's better to um, to show this on an example with with uh, the data uh, around the public transport. Um, two years ago, when we started the whole the whole uh, the whole attempt to get the public transport data. We were actually accused of uh, trying to get know-how of the company Hubs, which is at the moment having the exclusive contract with the Ministry of Transport, and uh, through through the through the contract, um, it's having access to all the public transport data data from from all around the Czech Republic. And my simple answer is no. We are not trying to get anyone's added value or own. Uh, added value which they built for, for the last five or six years of their existence. We are trying to get the source data which should be free at the first place and we have no, we have no interest at all about their added value that they built in the last five or six years. That's their value and it's absolutely fine to keep the value and trying to make some own product which they can sell to their customers. That's completely fine. We're just trying to get the public data which should be free at the first place. And from your questions, I'm not quite sure what would, how, how, how reasonable it would be for a company like Cessnam to get free data from the government or from the public sector and then give them the same data, give them free to someone else. It's obvious that it's easier to get the public data from the source, which is the government or the public sector. And if someone would ask, is Cessnam willing to give the data with the added value that the Cessnam would give to the data in, say, for example, one or two years of, of processing them, then I say, 
this doesn't make sense. It's the same story regarding Sesnam and Hubs. We don't want their added value. So why would someone ask for Sesnam for the same? We don't want their added value. We want the public data of the Czech Republic, not the data of the company Hubs or some other private company. It's their data, it's their value, it's their added value, and it's completely fine. Anyone could do that. We would like to have the data that we, as a taxpayer in the Czech Republic, we believe have an access to and should have an access to. It's the same for the citizen, same for the Czech business. These are the data which are already collected by the Czech government and the Czech public offices. And we believe that these data should be accessible to the anyone who's interested in. And we've already, it's already been said a few, few hours ago regarding the Estonian model, the data should be free at the first place so anyone can decide what he would like to build based on them and what added value he would like to put on the base, on the base free data that he has from the government. And of course, it doesn't make sense for the private companies to give their added value for free to anyone who asked, this is socialism, this, is, this, this doesn't make sense in, in my point of view. Fair enough, thank you very much. Other questions or comments from the audience? No? Okay. Oh, here, gentlemen, can we get a microphone here? Thank you. Uh, I've got a question for the Richard uh, Swithenham. Uh, my question is, uh, Richard, uh, are there on a level of European Commission any pressure for the standardization uh, of the data sets? For example, uh, because there are good uh, idea to compare data sets from uh, countries uh, between each other, for example. Are there any initiative there to, to do something that, or it's uh, on, the, on a state to do something like own data sets? Uh, well, one of the uh, follow-up actions to the uh, amendment to the directive on reuse of public sector information, which uh, we've, we have mentioned, uh, will be a uh, document setting out some uh, ideas from the Commission about uh, standard data sets. But that, simply, that, that will be um, a recommendation to the Member States about th the sort of data that uh, everybody should be making available. Uh, that's not standardization in the technical sense. Uh, another action which will uh, I think uh, feed through into the process of uh, exactly what is the content of the data sets that you can get out and, and how is it formatted and, and presented uh, will be the, um, uh, the portal, uh, the pan-European portal, which already exists uh, as a uh, part of a research project. Uh, it's called publicdata.eu. Uh, and obviously, uh, if you are part of a portal, uh, um, uh, if you are actively taking part uh, in the sense that you have decided to provide your data, uh, there, there is a certain degree of harmonization uh, that will occur because uh, that means the portal works, uh, works better. Thank you. One more question, and one more, and that is going to be it for today. Unfortunately, I time just, is not our friend. I would like just to remind what uh, had been said about the DEF at uh, the end of the last session, because especially on this question uh, regarding harmonization, it would be very useful if politicians comes to statisticians, because uh, we, uh, I think that we reached very high level of uh, harmonization on European level among statistical offices. And I think that it could be good to listen to us before you uh, accept any important uh, resolution. Thank you. Thank you. I believe you're from a statistical bureau. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your comment. And one more question or comment over there. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Cermak from ASECO company. I would like just to react on uh, your response regarding open data which would be provided from businesses as a social approach. Strictly don't agree and I hope that um, our partners from UK 
confirm that there are plenty of businesses who are deliberately post, uh, provide their data to the public because just of marketing purposes, you know, that nothing doing with socialism, that's, that's just intention, this doesn't harm their business and they, they do it completely freely. So just point for discussion. It's all about the business model, obviously. Thank you very much for your comment. I think that that's uh, a theme for uh, our next year's conference. Hopefully, we're going to see each other in 365 or maybe sooner. Now, my last question to all of you, and I will ask for a very short answer, gentlemen. I love to tease economists uh, and ask them to pull their crystal ball and tell me what is going to happen. I am not going to ask you what is going to happen. I'm going to ask you what you recommend should happen in the near future so your businesses or the sector itself is going to improve, meaning we're going to get some value out of the data or data, sorry. Uh, and let's just do it one by one. Ladislav, uh, your turn. Okay. I just believe we will get more, more data sets, so we will hire more people. It's quite easy. <laughs> we get some catastrophe data. We get a lot of mapping data. So we are waiting for some agriculture, forestry, so uh, we can create more applications, help more people. So, uh, you know, world will be happier. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. uh, so for me, what I'd like to see is uh, a presumption in favor of open. I'd like to see uh, data published uh, reliably uh, with clear data standards, so uh, possibly around open data certificates. And I'd like to see government starting to use some of the data services that are coming out and making it easy to do business. And finally, I'd like to see uh, the governments uh, reinvesting in the success of the, the sector. So if this turns out to be the fantastic new shift, then I'd like to see governments sort of continuing to think about how they can do more. Um, from, from my point of view, um, I, I believe that we need some real help from the government and from the politicians to open the data. That has two levels. The European level, which is very relevant to Czech Republic as well. We are not isolated. We, we have to look at the EU as well. So I'm willing there will be more data opening regulations than data protection regulations and, and similar hell on earth. So that's my first, first, uh, first wish and expectation. And from the government, from the Czech point of view, from the Czech government, um, I would like to see a similar approach as the UK did. Um, I'm afraid that without a 4C from, from the prime minister office or from, from the prime minister himself, there is no clear solution for the current state of, of data, or data, data openings issues. Um, there are so many different approaches in different departments in the Czech government that I can hardly imagine that there will be some ministry uh, of interior or ministry of, 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 um, of industry or some other ministry individually responsible for opening data in the whole government. I believe this is the major change that we have to accept and we have to do to put this topic on the top level to the Prime Minister's office, otherwise we won't solve any institution conflicts which will definitely arise between different departments when we really start opening the data and it will not be just some play for, for, for the voters but, but a real game. Then we will have some real issues that we will have to solve and this won't change on, on the department level. This will have to be solved from the upper level. So that's my wish and expectation. Thank you. Chris? Um, so for, for governments, I'd like governments to, I mean, of course, governments aren't, aren't single entities. There are many different entities with different interests. We have lots of people in government coming to us uh, and saying, we really would like to have this company register open, <laughs> but, but it's, it's not, and, uh, and can you help us with this? Um, uh, and it's a different department. Um, but one of the things I think uh, I'd like governments to start to, 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 instead of asking what are the costs and benefits of open data, to be asking themselves the opposite question. Let's supposing it's, it's, it's open, it's not going to cost very much, 
now do a cost-benefit analysis of how much it would, uh, how much, what would be lost by, and how much it would cost the, the, the country, the industry, uh, ordinary people, their lives by making it closed. Because that's really what's happened. You know, it always used to be open. It was all, always on paper and open. Since it's been digital, it's been closed down. So one is governments should, should, should ask themselves, what are the benefits? What are the actual benefits to our society, our country, to anti-corruption, to all these sorts of things by making it closed? To the, to the Czech uh, society, uh, you know, and anyone that wants to do this stuff, get good at scraping. You know, uh, ask, ask forgiveness, not permission. You know, uh, build stuff with the data. Product beats policy every single time. You know, you can spend six months, a year, two years trying to convince people, and then you know, just, you've got that far, that close to convincing them, and then they move the job, and someone else comes in, and you have to start all over again. Build some, build some cool stuff with some data that you, you, you've taken from the government, and, uh, uh, and that's a much better way of, uh, of convincing them. And finally, I mean, from an open corporate's point of view, we're, we're now moving away from, not moving away from, because it's our core thing about just company register data, we're now looking at, at all sorts of other public data, banking licenses, for example, government gazettes that relate to, 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 to companies. And, and pulling that and cleaning up and that, matching that to it. And I think that's going to be really transformative and actually going to start encouraging companies to, to, to be, uh, you know, uh, what, um, what Robert Hunter at the World Bank called um, uh, radical trans radically transparent. You know, what can we do? How can we, let's, let's assume transparency. How can we make this work for us from a business point of view? How can we build this into our business model and get a competitive march on, our, you know, uh, on, on, on the uh, other players in this market? Thanks. Thank you. Richard. Uh, well, obviously, the, um, the, there's a still uh, a lot to be done, uh, and the uh, governments and, and public bodies uh, have really got to uh, see that uh, opening up their data is uh, actually beneficial, uh, not, I mean, not just uh, to citizens in general, but also to the uh, public bodies themselves. Thank you very much, and thank you for being short on time. Martin. <laughs> uh, Ravana, there are two things, the, the wish and the crystal ball. So the wish would obviously be that uh, the European Commission takes this as a unique opportunity to really do what its purpose is, you know, to create a free and transparent environment for all of us to live our lives and do our business as we like, you know, just to open the environment and to resist any temptation to find reasons which data should not be released or how we should use it, just to resist the temptation, just to open the environment. And uh, then the crystal ball, would I bet on it? Well, although I'm wishing Richard best, uh, I see some more promising investments. <laughs> the, econ the economist has spoken. Martin Buddha, Capital Linked, Richard Swettenham, advisor for open data to the European Commission. Then we have Chris Taggart, CEO of Open Corporates. To my right, Michal Feist, CEO of Cesnam CZ. Then there is, who's there? Richard Sterling, <laughs> sorry about it. Richard Sterling from uh, Open Data Institute. And last but not least, Vladislav uh, Čapek, CEO of Geosense. Thank you, gentlemen, very much indeed. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, and have a good rest of the day.